What's going on guys, this is Rob. Uh, if you guys enjoy my content, make sure you hit the subscribe button and make sure you hit that little bell so you never miss out on my sexy voice. Okay, so as promised, we are continuing on our Green Lantern Sundays, and at this point we pick up with Brightest Day. To be honest with you guys, after everything that went on with Blackest Night, the fact that we had covered like everything from the beginning of Green Lantern Rebirth with Hal Jordan back when he first returned, all the way up to the end of Blackest Night, I was ready for a break. <laughs> I was like, I need a break from Green Lantern stuff, which is one of the reasons why we uploaded those uh, full story videos, is because basically it allowed a lot of people to play catch up, to basically, you know, get caught back up in case they'd forgotten about a lot of the things that we had talked about. So. Kind of jumping back into this, remember, Blackest Night and Brightest Day was effectively a soft reboot for DC. I mean, keep in mind, DC's only ever really done a hard reboot twice in their publication history. Crisis on Infinite Earths and The New 52. Remember, those hard reboots are basically designed that DC asks you to pretend like they never published characters before. But with Brightest Day, it was kind of a soft reboot. Because remember, Blackest Night was really just kind of every superhero and every supervillain who had ever died basically coming back by way of the Black Lantern Rings of Death. And so that was tantamount to DC. DC taking every superhero who ever died and then just putting him on the board. Brightest Day and really the end of Blackest Night was kind of the question, who do we keep? And of course, that's why DC chose 12 heroes and 12 villains on each side. Now, of course, Brightest Day picks up with the aftermath of that. It basically says, here are the heroes and villains who have been resurrected from the dead. And we'll find out who they are as we, you know, as we continue to go through Brightest Day. But the whole idea behind this was that it was basically saying, we're going to choose these characters based on whatever stories we think we can tell, whatever stories will basically boost sales. Because while I wouldn't say that DC was struggling financially in the mid 2000s the whole idea behind these stories was to basically continue the the concept of grabbing characters who existed either before crisis on infinite earths or after crisis on infinite earths who had basically died and then finding a way to return them of course this really comes as kind of like an aftermath of sorts to like the death of superman different things like that and we'll talk more about how that that story influenced dc comics when we get into like bart allen explained different things like that but this initially picks up with boston brand now remember boston brand appeared back in strange adventures back in 1960 I don't remember exactly what comic, what, what issue it was, but Boston Brand was, you know, basically known as Dead Man, and he was a guy who was, you know, part of a high wire act, more or less, so he'd been shot and he fell to his death, and of course, the entire basis behind his character was tracking down the person who had killed him, but it allowed him the ability to essentially jump from one host body to the next. With him basically returning to life, he is effectively kind of like this harbinger of the White Lantern, in the sense that he's really the only person right now wielding a White Lantern ring. Now, remember, at the end of Blackest Night, Sinestra was the first official White Lantern in terms of the first person to wield the ring and use its absolute power to defeat Necron and basically bring an end to Blackest Night. But with this particular story, Boston Brand is kind of serving this enigmatic purpose. He doesn't exactly know what it is he's supposed to be doing. One of the first things that's established is that the White Lantern ring does have the ability to resurrect the dead, which of course we end up finding out halfway because of the events of Blackest Night, but also because of the fact that he basically revives a bird that had fallen to its death. But again, for him, it's very mysterious here. So the cool thing about this is that because Brightest Day was designed to be a soft reboot, and because a lot of people most likely picked up with Green Lantern and read a lot of the Green Lantern stories, what this did is it basically allowed DC to segue the reader into the return of a lot of these characters that they weren't necessarily wildly familiar with, or if they were familiar with them, it was really through name only. And so initially it jumps to Arthur Curry Aquaman, who of course had previously died and came back during Blackest Night. But the whole idea with this is it really kind of toys with the notion that a lot of these individuals remember their time during Blackest Night. They remember being resurrected resurrected from the dead. They remember being Black Lanterns. And so it kind of creates this inner turmoil to a degree because the question becomes, how do they deal with that darker version of themselves? Remember, in a lot of ways, they were just kind of a passenger in their own body. The Black Lantern rings were the ones that were the guiding force. They were controlling everything. And so again, for Aquaman, it's dealing with these various scenarios. Eobard Thawne, for example, of course, is still alive and well. We have the Flash who races off to meet Digger Harkness, Captain Boomerang. These are the kind of things that take place. But notice this, not everyone who was a villain and died and came back is going to stay a villain. You know, like Digger Harkness, for example, really kind of summarizes the nature of Shawshank Redemption and the fact that this banker who'd been framed for a murder he didn't commit, he was thrown in prison, he was kind of left there, and he used the prison system as his own means to effectively not only free himself, but to find a better life than the one he had before. And while Digger Harkness does kind of make this illusion, which indicates, yeah, like eventually I'm going to break out of here and when I do, I'm going to make a better life, the question that's initially asked by Flash is, is this a better criminal life or a better good life? And Digger's response is the exact same thing that Morgan Freeman's character offered in the movie, either get busy living 
or get busy dying. And so it's really one of these things where it teases the idea that Captain Boomerang is just kind of tired of doing the same old thing. If being a villain led him to his own death, then why continue to be a villain? This of course follows up with the idea of Hawkman and, and Hawkgirl, the fact that these characters have really just sort of died and been resurrected thousands of times over the course of their entire existence. But the cool thing about this little tidbit here is it actually allows us to grab the concept of Dark Knight's metal and roll it into this story. And that's kind of the cool thing about this. That's one of the reasons why DC Rebirth is such an important line of storytelling, because it basically allows you to take all these older stories that happened before 2011, throw them back into continuity as long as they're referenced, and then in turn basically say, so like this is what was going on in the background while all that was happening. For example, we know by virtue of Dark Knight's Metal that Carter Hall was exploring the mystery of Nth Metal. What's Nth Metal? Where did it come from? You know, we could take that entire concept and throw it into Brightest Day and say before the events of Carter Hall's death, he was exploring the nature of Nth Metal. And it works. Again, you know, because of the fact that Boston Brand is basically being teleported from one place to the next by the White Lantern Ring, this is basically just designed to kind of give us this tour of sorts with regards to who's still alive, who's not still alive, how they're dealing with the fact that they've been resurrected. For example, Maxwell Lord. Maxwell Lord, having been one of the most notable villains of DC's history, was basically a guy who used his mind control to effectively seize control of Superman. He had taken over Brother Eye, the global uh, satellite system developed by Batman, to monitor superheroes, and in turn, he was killed by Wonder Woman. And so because of the fact that he's been resurrected, he's right back to his old schemes. Now, of course, this spins out into a solo series of its own, which we probably won't cover. The story itself never really resonated with me and it's not really crucial to Brightest Day. Now, one of the most welcome resurrections when it came to DC's Brightest Day event was the return of Martian Manhunter. Because Martian Manhunter was one of these characters that really resonated with a lot of fans in a lot of different ways. For Martian Manhunter, he's always been a man of two worlds, of course, a man of Mars, but he's also been a superhero of Earth. And so again, that's a common theme that you find when it comes to a lot of different superheroes in DC. And that's one of the reasons why the interpersonal relationships work so well. I mean, take for example, Hal Jordan, Guy Gardner, Jon Stewart, and Kyle Rayner. They're Green Lanterns. And so while they are superheroes on Earth, they're torn between their loyalties. As Green Lanterns, they have a far more important role to play in the overall universe than they do on Earth. And there have been times where they've basically been called to choose. You've got a conflict on Earth that needs your attention, but you've also got a conflict in the universe that requires the acts of the entire Green Lantern Corps. Which one do you choose? And it creates a lot of rifts, and it even goes as far as to create animosity between the Green Lanterns and the Guardians of the Universe because they're basically being told the goings-on on Earth are insignificant in comparison to the goings-on of the universe. And so for Martian Manhunter, it's always been this idea that for him, he has to basically maintain this loyalty to his Martian people, but at the same time, also ensure that he's able to, to maintain himself as a productive member of the superhero community on Earth. Now, one of the other returns was a character by the name of Jade. And this was really interesting because this was really DC and Jeff Johns introducing the potential of a love triangle with regards to Kyle Rayner, which is not something we've seen all that often. When it comes to the love interest of Kyle Rayner, for the most part, they've always been pretty linear. It's always been like, you know, this character's introduced and then they die and then that character's introduced, then they die. It's always kind of been that way. Jade, of course, is the daughter of Alan Scott, the very first Green Lantern in DC's publication history. Now, in truth, uh, following the events of, of Infinite Crisis, the restoration of the multiverse, DC basically said Alan Scott was Green Lantern from another universe. But Jade was at one point a love interest of Kyle Rayner before Saranic Natu. Of course, Saranic Natu being the daughter of Sinestro because of the fact that Saranic does have feelings for Kyle Rayner and Kyle Rayner does have feelings for, for Saranic, it did kind of tease this idea that with Jade's return, Kyle Rayner is going to be torn between both. And the stories of Kyle Rayner in DC are nothing if not dramatic, you know, focusing on the nature of his character, different things like that. And a lot of fans love it for that reason. Of course, this is nipped in the bud almost immediately when Kyle Rayner basically arrives to meet both Jade and Saranic Natu and says, hey, look, Jade, we were in love once, but that time has passed. You play a very important role and you're needed here, but in truth, my heart belongs to Saranic Natu at the moment. And so it is interesting because it also plays on the events of Blackest Night in the sense that Jade really feels kind of guilty for the fact that as she was used as a Black Lantern, she killed various people and even fought Kyle Rayner and used their love against him, different things like that. But again, it's really kind of cool because it feeds on the aftermath of this whole Blackest Night event as it continues on with these trends of people dealing with all these different consequences and their own emotional state and different things like that. Now, of course, one of the most notable aftermaths of the event of Blackest Night was the character of Firestorm. And the reason why is because for years, it had always been Ronnie Raymond and Professor Martin Stein. And then eventually it became Jason Rush and his girlfriend. And what DC ended up doing here is they basically said, because of the fact that the character of Firestorm has always struggled in terms of publication history, which is to say, following the Martin Stein, Ronnie Raymond disbanding, that the title never really seemed to recover, DC had this idea to basically sit down 
down and say, well, then let's grab the characters of Jason Rush, who does have a following, and let's grab the character of Ronnie Raymond, who has an established following in the sense that he's the most well-known version of Firestorm alongside Martin Stein, and let's combine them together. And it really kind of works by virtue of the fact that you end up having this irritation in the sense that with Ronnie Raymond having been brought back to life as a Black Lantern, and then in turn resurrected fully as a White Lantern, Jason Rush looks at him and says, you're the reason that my girlfriend is dead. And so it is interesting because what we basically end up getting is this kind of Ronnie Raymond, Jason Rush version of Firestorm. It was an experiment. How will readers respond to this? What will be the likelihood that they will find this to be interesting and they will find this to be intriguing? And so again, it's cool because what this does is it really kind of begins to wrap up the Brightest Day number zero issue by basically saying, hey, look, here's where things stand at the moment. You basically have Boston Brand who's being met with these visions and these experiences of all these individuals who have died and have somehow come back to life. But it's hitting home at the nature of this idea that there are people like, you know, Green Arrow, for example, who come back, but that they all serve a particular purpose. What that purpose is, we won't find out immediately. Instead, what we end up doing here is we pick up with the Green Lantern tie-in. Now, the Green Lantern tie-in is actually really, really cool because what this does is it really kind of fleshes out the second half of Brightest Day in terms of the role it plays. And the reason why I say that is because with Brightest Day, one half is dealing with the aftermath of the various superheroes and villains who have returned to life. The other half is all the other Lantern entities out there, the Orange Lantern entity, the Red Lantern entity, all those different things. This really explores all that stuff and really begins to build on it. Now, of course, this also kind of sees the return of the Trinity with regards to Green Lanterns, which is to say Sinestro, Carol Ferris, and Hal Jordan. And it is kind of cool because what it says is that in the aftermath of Blackest Night, that a sort of truce was stuck, you know, with regards to Sinestro. You stay away, we stay away, and everything is all right. You know, everything stays calm. But with Sinestro, his presence here is to basically say, there is a White Lantern running around the planet Earth right now, and there's a White Lantern central power battery, which means there's a White Lantern ring. The question we have to ask is, what does this mean? What's the significance of this? This is cool because it kind of sets the Green Lantern core on, or I guess, you know, really Hal Jordan, uh, Sinestro, and Carol Ferris on this path of trying to figure out what's going on with the White Lantern, exploring and expanding that whole mythos. Now, of course, a lot of the other things that go on too with regards to the other Lanterns, for example, Saint Walker and the Blue Lantern, it's really just kind of this idea that they're basically laying to rest the bodies of those who were just normal people and were used by Black Lanterns to, you know, increase the Black Lantern number. But this also basically picks up with the Green Lantern core itself in the sense that for some reason, this not being fully explained here, Guy Gardner, as well as Ganthet, are basically meeting with Atrocitus of the Red Lanterns and striking some kind of a bargain. And this is cool because the whole idea behind this is, remember, when it comes to Atrocitus, he has an absolute hatred for the Guardians of the Universe in the sense that the Guardians of the Universe created the Manhunter robots. The Manhunter robots went awry, they attacked Atrocitus' home world, they obliterated his family, and he gave himself over to pure rage, forming the Red Lantern Corps. And so because of this whole thing, the idea is that this leads into a story called the Revolt of the Alpha Lanterns. Now, in truth, we're not going to do that as a separate video. Instead, we're going to take Revolt of the Alpha Lanterns and we're just going to kind of throw it in to the main line of videos that we're doing with Brightest Day. So we'll just kind of roll that into everything else that we're that we're sort of publishing here. But with the character of Ganthet, remember, Ganthet and Saeed are very particular among the Guardians of the Universe. Well, the Guardians of the Universe are like the first sentient beings in existence, more or less. And they are the ones who are responsible for creating the Green Lantern Corps. The Guardians of the Universe had cast off their emotions. And so they are very much beings who are logical. So if you guys are coming from Star Trek, think of them in a lot of ways like Vulcans. And so because of this, Ganthet and Sade are the ones who basically looked at the prophecy of Blackest Night in the sense that there would be this war of light. All these Lantern Corps would go, you know, go to war with one another. And where the other Guardians of the Universe said, that's ridiculous, it's a fear tactic, we'll write it out of the Book of Oa and we'll treat it like it never existed. Ganthet and Sade were a little wiser and said, no, it does exist. That prophecy is real. And we have to form the Blue Lantern Corps to basically get them to unify as opposed to fight against one another. And so it was basically the arrogance and the hubris of the other Guardians of the Universe that allowed Blackest Night to reach its crescendo. And so as a result, Ganthet and Sade are really kind of apart from the other Guardians of the Universe. They basically don't really stand alongside them. And this really comes to fruition when Ganthet resigns his position among the Guardians of the Universe and says, I'm just going to become a Green Lantern for Sector Zero. Now, this is a really big deal because what this means is that one of the Guardians is no longer playing their role. Instead, Ganthet, in a lot of ways, has given up on the Guardians of the Universe and basically said, your arrogance and your hubris led to the Blackest Night event. And so even if there are times when you're simply not going to adhere to what it is that goes on with regards to the universe, someone needs to. And there needs to be a guardian that will protect the entire sector. And so because of this, because Ganthet will be the protector of, of Sector Zero, where the guardians of the universe make their home, it means he'll likely be one of the most powerful Green Lanterns out there because it's basically all the power of a guardian, which is astronomical in scale, enough to dwarf people like Superman, and then in turn amplify that power with a Green Lantern ring. Now, this also deals with the events of, you know, Fallout with regards to everybody sort of envisioning the events of, of Black 
Blackest Night and so on and so forth. But even one of the guys, one of these Green Lanterns is basically just kind of whisked away. You know, Rookie uh, Lantern Pralvar, I think is how you pronounce it. We'll call him Ralkar. I think it makes sense. The H is silent. We'll just assume that it's silent. <laughs> but it is kind of intriguing because again, all this really deals with the idea that the Alpha Lanterns really seem to be revolting, seem to be expanding their number. And keep in mind, the Alpha Lanterns were created explicitly by the Guardians of the Universe, yet another instance of them really kind of giving way to their own arrogance and their own hubris in the sense that because of the fact that the Sinestro Corps war basically saw the Sinestro Corps formed by Thal Sinestro going to war against the Green Lantern Corps, the Green Lanterns being given the ability to kill in order to basically face off against the Sinestro Corps, it led to one of their member killing a Sinestro Corps member who was unarmed. She, of course, was put on trial, and of course, she was found guilty and exiled from the Green Lanterns. But in response to this, the Guardian said there has to be an aspect of the Green Lantern Corps that polices the Green Lanterns, and that's why the Alpha Lanterns were made. The problem with this is that as far as the Guardians are concerned, the Alpha Lanterns are part machine, more or less, and part sentient being. And so in their mind, the Alpha Lanterns can't make mistakes. And so what this does is it really sort of puts the Alpha Lanterns in a position that if they chose to revolt, that the Guardians wouldn't necessarily realize what was going on initially. That's really kind of what's being done here in the sense that the teammate of Ralkar, you know, the Lantern that went missing by the Alpha Lanterns, is searching for his partner only to find out he's been converted into an Alpha Lantern, and the Alpha Lanterns themselves are basically bolstering their numbers. So again, a lot of themes coming out of the first part of Brightest Day, basically setting the stage for a lot of these storylines that really sort of begin to evolve and to grow and different things like that. Okay, so as we continue on with our stories on Brightest Day, we're kind of at an impasse here. And this is one of the reasons why I wanted to cover the first part of Brightest Day in the sense that we basically had like all these things going on. You know, we had the, the main Brightest Day story and we had, you know, the Green Lantern Corps and we had the green uh, main Green Lantern title. And the reason why is because Brightest Day is not like Blackest Night, right? Like Blackest Night for the most part, it did follow the escapades of these characters like Green Lantern Corps and Kyle Rayner and Guy Gardner and different things like that. It did follow them to, uh, you know, with regards to their escapades, but it all kind of segued into the conclusion of Blackest Night. With regards to Brightest Day, it doesn't necessarily work that way. The stories of Green Lantern, the stories of the Green Lantern Corps of Emerald Warriors, those actually segue into a story called uh, the War of the Green Lanterns. Uh, with regards to Brightest Day, the main event itself, which spanned about 24 issues and it was a twice monthly series running for a whole year, that actually details the return of 12 heroes and 12 villains. So we can do that, but if all people really care about, which I surmise, all you you guys are really interested in is just like you know the Green Lantern entities and the the various Lantern cores that are out there. That's really just like the main Green Lantern story. That that's really all that details or really the the biggest emphasis of, of all that kind of stuff. Now again, we can kind of play it by ear and we can just sort of sort of shoot for it. I mean, because of the fact that the the Green Lantern tie-ins, quote unquote, for lack of a better word, for Brightest Day are pretty limited in the sense that they run from like 53 to 62. There's ample room for us to basically just leave out the main Brightest Day event and then cover the Green Lantern comics, cover Green. Lantern Lantern Corps and cover Emerald Warriors and kind of go from there. But for the sake of this video, we're going to stick with the main Green Lantern story to give you guys an idea of, of what to expect if we were to go this route. And what this does is it initially just kind of picks up with uh, really just some guys being pretty shady in a subway, just giving people a hard time and like, you know, robbing folks, stuff like that. When they're suddenly met with the arrival of Dexstar. Now, Dexstar is one of these characters that a lot of like a lot of Lantern fans absolutely love. They love Dexstar. And he is a great character. He's a cat. He's a Red Lantern cat. <laughs> <laughs> and it's pretty awesome. Like, he's pretty brutal. The the story he has, like, his origin story is pretty sad, too. Like, uh, I believe it was that he was adopted by a woman. And then uh, some people broke in, and, like, I think they ended up ending her life. And the result was that uh, Dexter was kind of cast out. Then some people grabbed him, and they were going to, like, throw him over a bridge. When he suddenly met with a red lantern ring, and then just, like, goes ballistic and, like, kills the guys who were trying to take him out, and then just kind of goes from there. It's pretty hardcore. <laughs> it's pretty brutal. And it's really sad, but it's actually pretty brutal. Now, the other half of this is that it also comes with the arrival of Atrocitus. Now remember, Atrocitus never really left Earth. I mean, he kind of did, but he's sort of been bouncing back and forth with regards to the events following Blackest Night. In the sense that Blackest Night really kind of brought all these different Lantern Corps to Earth itself because that's where the battle against the Black Lanterns was taking place. So it made sense that they would all kind of segue into that one location. But the whole idea here is that this focuses really in a lot of ways on the kind of aftermath of the White Lantern Corps. That's why I say we kind of bounce back and forth a little bit in the sense that the main Brightest Day story basically said, 
hey look at the end of blackest night sinestro basically became the first white lantern after discovering the white lantern entity and then suddenly a white lantern uh, power battery appeared and no one's been able to lift it it's almost like this sword in the stone kind of situation in the sense that no one can really pick it up so the initial response of like carol ferris you know as a star sapphire and sinestro and how jordan is well we'll each try it in turn and we'll see what happens now of course in the attempt to pick this up what they end up getting is this kind of feedback of sorts whereby the lantern really kind of shows them these characters that have come back these characters that have basically re-emerged you know aquaman for example was brought back as a result of blackest night martian manhunter different things like that and again we talked about that in the main blackest night story the blackest night and brightest day were basically designed to be soft reboots it was a way for dc to come back and say okay so here are these characters that have died in some form or fashion over the course of our publication history after we first rebooted in 1985 and we want to bring some of these characters back and so we're going to use blackest night to do it they're all going to come back as zombies and then at the end of blackest night the white lantern is going to quote unquote cure people and those that we want to keep will return to normal those that we don't want to keep will just go back to being dead and it served its purpose in the sense that only a handful of people came back but the biggest brunt of this and the most significant part of this for you know uh, Hal Jordan and for Sinestro and for Carol Ferris is they're basically shown the entities and this is a very big deal remember this is all brand new stuff or at least at the time that it was being written by Jeff Johns it was brand new stuff this stuff never existed before it's not like this is you know retreading water of the Green Lantern mythos this is all new there had never been entities that existed before I mean even the concept of parallax that was just something that Hal Jordan called himself originally it wasn't until Jeff Johns took over the Green Lantern title that he said no 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 what actually happened was that Hal Jordan was possessed by the parallax fear entity and that's where that whole thing comes from what we end up finding out here is the predator belongs to the star sapphires ophidian belongs to the orange lanterns adara belongs to the blue lanterns you know proselyte belongs to the uh to the indigo tribe the butcher of course one of the more popular ones for the red lanterns you know this is the whole the whole thing we're basically saying that these are the entities that represent that aspect of the emotional spectrum remember the emotional spectrum is just kind of like an amalgamation of things which is to say the emotional aspect of fear is a result of everybody in the universe having felt fear at some point along the line same thing with rage and love and, and so on and so forth all those different things now what we do here is we sidetrack for a second and we actually pick up with ion we pick up with sodom yacht and sodom yacht was actually a character that we really kind of explored a bit but didn't do a whole lot with in the you know in the aftermath of like sinestro core war different things like that if you guys remember that far back to our videos sodom yacht is a daxamite you know essentially what this means is that he is uh basically a kryptonian without actually being a kryptonian and the reason why was because again you know at some point along the line in the early history of krypton's existence some kryptonians left they basically walked away from the planet and they settled somewhere else they settled on a planet called daxam and for the most part they just sort of existed in isolation they just didn't really deal with anything on the outside anybody who showed up to their planet was usually executed in order to keep their existence secret sodom yacht was a kid who basically looked to the stars and wanted to explore the spaceways and this all really came to a head when he was offered the opportunity to be a green lantern but it was essentially a way for dc to answer the question what would happen if superman became a green lantern without actually using superman just because of the fact that he had his own stories going on at the time and really a lot of the really the editors for superman you know wouldn't let that happen and so what we got was sodom yacht who was basically kind of brought back and introduces the idea that he is you know if exposed to a yellow sun will have all the powers of superman and it was cool for what it was uh it was it was pretty interesting in fact there was a point in time when daxon was on the verge of being totally obliterated and the result i mean you know with like sinestro core members attacking the planet different things like that sodom yacht arrived at his home planet he transformed the red sun into a yellow sun and gave all of his people powers the aftermath to this was that when his people started taking to the spaceways they started basically punishing anybody who wasn't like them and so the result is that it allowed for you know sodom yacht who had basically been kind of sitting in stasis to essentially go back to being his normal self in the sense that some guardian of the universe basically comes along and in turn yanks him back you know brings him out of the star and returns him back to life more or less in the sense that the star goes back to being a red star uh sodom yacht emerges and basically they remove the ion entity now remember that was something that we talked about with regards to like kyle rayner and it was really one of the first times that we had seen that that in the history of dc comics uh it was essentially this idea that kyle rayner had possessed a couple different varying levels of power but he simply just called himself ion this again was another change by jeff johns in the sense that jeff johns came along and he said actually it's not just that kyle rayner just started calling himself ion one day what he is is he's basically host for the entity of the green lantern core basically the whale entity called ion the guardians of the universe put that entity in him should they all go extinct kyle rayner will be the one to bring them back that was the whole basis behind it now of course in sinestro core war that entity was yanked out of him by thal sinestro and replaced with parallax and in turn the entity was placed inside of sodom yacht and it's really just kind of been there ever since up until right now but again it's a way to sort of wrap these threads up to kind of bring these things to an end
end and say, okay, things are back to their status quo now. In the sense of Sodom Yacht, it's just back to being a Green Lantern, presumably with the same powers as Superman, but he's no longer a host for the Green Lantern entity out there. And so what seems to be going on here is that someone is going through and capturing the entities. That's essentially what's happening. They take the Green Lantern entity of Ion away from Sodom Yacht, did the same thing with the Parallax entity, and it looks like they're hunting for all the others, for the Blue Lantern entity and the Orange Lantern and Red Lantern and so on and so forth. That looks to be what's basically going on here. And so the result is that when the question is asked by Hal Jordan, really kind of more, uh, you know, rhetorical than anything else, what are we doing? What are, you know, what, what is the, this whole ring asking of us? The ring simply responds by saying, you know, Atrocitus will help you find the entities. And so that's what this turns into is basically a race to locate the entities. And it's cool because what this means is it gives us a kind of tour of this whole thing, a tour of the expansion of the Green Lantern and the, you know, really the overall Lantern core mythos. And that's one of the reasons why the Green Lantern story is so significant is because even if you have events that kind of cross over to a degree, for the most part, you can walk away from the main event like, you know, like Brightest Day and focus only on Green Lantern. And it's a self-contained story for the most part that allows you to just kind of continue on with what you've read, running all the way up through like Sinestro Core War and Blackest Night without really having, feel, you know, feeling lost or anything like that or dumping all your money into comics. Now, of course, for Atrocitus himself, he's doing the exact same thing he's always done, where he's basically using, you know, blood prophecy to either see the future or something like that. And this instance, the question is, where are the entities located at? Now, of course, with the arrival of Hal Jordan and, and Sinestro and Carol Ferris, it does present kind of a cool situation because immediately a fight breaks out. <laughs> which is exactly what we would expect. You know, it's, it's, it's one of those things where it's kind of come to be the standard, like, hey, Atrocitus, we need your help. Attack! You know, and he just immediately starts attacking everybody. And, uh, and a, you know, a great big huge conflict takes place. Now, of course, in the middle of all this, the group is basically met with the arrival of Lobo. Now, a little bit of history here. Uh, Lobo made his debut back in like Omega Man number three uh, in June of 1983, and he was created by Roger Stifler. And it's pretty common knowledge by now, pretty much, you know, exceedingly well known. Lobo was designed to be a parody of Wolverine. That, that's really what he is. And a lot of this was because of the fact that Wolverine was exceedingly over the top to a degree. And because of that, DC really kind of countered by saying, okay, well, like, let's make Lobo. Let's just have a guy who just rides around on a motorcycle. He's almost completely indestructible, and he's basically just a bounty hunter. That's really what he is. Now, Making him a bounty hunter, as far as I'm aware, that was originally Roger Stifler's idea because what it would do is it would allow for the character of Lobo to just kind of appear and disappear in DC Comics. Having him be a bounty hunter means that he would just like show up based on a contract. So, you know, for whatever reason, somebody put a contract out on Superman, you'd see Lobo and Superman fight. It would usually be an even battle and then Lobo would just leave and that would be the end of that. And then he wouldn't show up for another, you know, six months to a year or something along those lines. So it was actually pretty eloquent in terms of how they decided to roll his character in and what they decided to do with him. But the other half of this is that we also deal with, you know, Lobo basically having, uh, really being here for the purpose of taking out Atrocitus. And this works. And it, it is, it's really, really interesting because when it comes to the character of Atrocitus, we know that he's gone through and just committed like all these heinous acts. We would expect this to happen. Not only that, it's actually a pretty cool battle because remember, Lobo has gone toe to toe with Superman on a multitude of occasions. And so seeing him face off against Atrocitus is really like watching Superman battle Atrocitus without the moral compass of Superman, the willingness to hold back. Instead, it's just a matter of, hey, there's a bounty on you. And like one way or another, I aim to collect. Like <laughs> I'm getting paid. And, and, and it is cool. It's, it's really intriguing. The problem with this is that Hal Jordan is told by the White Lantern, Atrocitus has your mission. And so it's basically this idea that they have to ally themselves with Atrocitus. Now, remember, this goes against everything Hal Jordan stands for in almost every conceivable way. I mean, if we had to take the character of Atrocitus and the Red Lanterns, and we had to ask the question, what's their purpose in DC? Their purpose is to destroy the Green lanterns and to destroy the guardians of the universe. Why? Because the guardians of the universe originally made the manhunter robots to police the universe. The manhunter robots went awry and they obliterated basically everything in one sector of the universe. And that resulted in Atrocitus's rage really kind of building up and him forming the red lanterns. And so because of the fact that his family was obliterated, he basically has a vendetta against the guardians of the universe. Because the green lanterns were created by the guardians in the aftermath of the manhunters as a way to basically improve on their idea of policing the universe, the red lanterns in turn hate the Green Lanterns because they're basically agents of the Guardians of the Universe. And so, again, that's one of the reasons why for Hal Jordan, it's, it's very much reluctant. In his mind, he'd rather see Atrocitus just die. But it does make for a pretty cool battle because with Lobo being so durable, when you have like Thal Sinestro who conjures you or who creates these constructs in an attempt to take out Lobo, Lobo just kind of smashes through them and even hits Sinestro with his own constructs. And it is cool because then you have Carol Ferris who tries to encase them as the Star Sapphires usually do, encase a being in their energy and then in 
turn, try to move them towards love, and uh, and Lobo just breaks out of the entire construct. Now, in truth, if we were going to read between the lines here, we could probably deduce the fact that this is really Jeff Johns bringing the character of Lobo in and saying, hey, I don't know if you guys are interested, but here's how someone like Lobo stands against all the lanterns, and like, they don't stand a chance. <laughs> of course, in response to this, you of course have Dexter fighting the dog of Lobo, uh, and of course, Hal Jordan basically steps up and says, look, I hate to be the one to have to do this, but you, you got to keep your hands off Atrocitus. Now, remember, it's not like Lobo is new to Hal Jordan. Hal Jordan has fought against Lobo on a multitude of occasions alongside the Justice League, alongside Superman. He's well-versed in how powerful Lobo is. And so notice this, Hal Jordan doesn't really like skirt by. He's not like, oh, well, you know, Lobo's here, whatever, you know, we'll ignore him and then we'll go about our business. It's no, dude, Lobo's here, man. Like this is a big deal. Now, of course, because of the fact that it really is just kind of overwhelming odds. I mean, it's the Star Sapphires, it's the Green Lanterns, you know, the whole nine yards. At this point, it really kind of breaks down to, okay, Lobo can't win against all these guys at once, especially considering that Thal Sinestro, Carol Ferris, and Hal Jordan have allied themselves with Atrocitus. So the result is that Lobo basically just leaves. Now, what we would expect here is that Lobo would return eventually, because normally when a contract is taken out and someone hires Lobo to take out some person, Lobo will keep coming back, unless somebody like talks him out of it, or unless the story just calls for him to not come back. I don't, I don't know. But the fact remains here that it is an intriguing situation because ultimately Atrocitus just kind of leaves. You know, he just says whatever. Of course, the, the lanterns will have to follow after him in order to, to gain their mission. But what we also end up finding out here is that this was basically a task that was bestowed on Lobo by Atrocitus himself, that Atrocitus took out a hit on himself and he hired Lobo to collect that bounty. So the reason for this and the motivation for this isn't initially explained here. In fact, we don't really find out in the story. It's just for whatever reason, Atrocitus hired Lobo to take him out so that, you know, Hal Jordan and Carol Ferris and, and Thal Sinestro would come to his aid. Now, in truth, this is probably Atrocitus, if, if I'm gonna be, you know, brazen here, being a little socially awkward. That's probably what this is. Instead of just saying, hey, look guys, uh, we've had our issues in the past, but we need to work together to find the entities. You know, it's, I can't let you know that I need your help. So I'm going to take a hit out on myself and we're gonna have to work together. And then you guys will be my friends, you know, and then we'll go forward as not being enemies. Uh, that kind of seems to be what's going on here. Very socially awkward, very weird. Uh, a normal human being would just say, hey, I need your all's help. <laughs> But, you know, it is kind of intriguing and it is kind of funny because, again, you know, we'll find out what the motivation of Atrocitus is as we go on through, you know, into this whole Green Lantern arc. But it is cool because what this does is it leaves us with the idea that Lobo basically took a Red Lantern ring for himself. That at some point along the line, Lobo may very well return as a Red Lantern, which is cool. Okay, so I just want to say this before we actually jump into this video. The colony is so good. The show, dude, the show with like Sawyer from Lost. Oh my God, dude, that show is so amazing. If you guys aren't watching that, you guys are sorely missing out. So you guys need to go check that out. It's actually on Netflix for the first two seasons. Anyway, so we're continuing on with our whole thing on, on Brightest Day. And uh, the general consensus really seemed to be that a lot of people really just enjoyed the idea of like the lantern entities. That a lot of people didn't really care about like the 12 heroes and villains that came back. And when people say, I want to know about the Green Lantern, usually what they're saying is, I want to know about the Green Lantern mythos. I don't really want to know about the entities. And that's kind of a, that's a reasonable stance to take. I mean, it's not unreasonable at all. So we're going to go ahead and, and kind of continue on this trend. Now, the cool thing is that in the last video, we basically kind of covered the idea that according to this newly created White Lantern, or really the newly established White Lantern, that someone or something is running around and capturing all these different entities that exist out there with regards to the various Lantern cores. Now, this is intriguing because this is basically Jeff John's way of setting in motion this kind of indication of what the various entities are about. And this is why I say this part of the story, really this part of the Green Lantern mythos is probably the most important stuff until we get to like Wrath of the First Lantern. This really expands it more than anything else. And that's the nature of this. I mean, we talked about that when we first jumped into this and we started the Green Lantern rebirth stories and like, you know, how Jordan wanted and all that kind of stuff. We said, as time goes on, this mythos will start to expand by huge amounts. And, and we've seen that. I mean, you had Sinestro Core War, which basically eliminated the rules that Green Lanterns couldn't kill people. So now they can. We also had the Sinestro Core, which brought about this other Lantern core that previously didn't exist. Now we have the Red Lanterns and we have the Star Sapphires and we have the Blue Lanterns, all these different Lantern cores that have kind of spawned out there, the White Lanterns, the Black Lanterns. And that's the whole idea behind this. What this does is it takes the next step. It's like math, two plus two equals four. Now it's time for us to multiply two times two, which still equals four. But the fact remains here <laughs> that it is cool because we're taking the next steps. What we're doing is we're saying, okay, so we have these Lantern cores and these Lantern cores basically draw their energy from the emotion 
emotional spectrum. So what's inside the emotional spectrum? That's what this whole thing builds on. And that's the cool thing. Now, this all goes back to Ion, right? The Ion entity. That was a way for Jeff Johns to kind of come back when he took over the Green Lantern line of stories and to say, well, when Kyle Rayner became, uh, became Ion, he wasn't just Ion. I mean, it was a name at the time, but he's basically the torchbearer, the Green Lantern entity Ion, the representation of the Green Lantern Corps energy that's been thrown into Kyle Rayner. Eventually it was removed, but that's where that whole thing came from. That there are these beings out there that represent the sum totality of what each part of the emotional spectrum is. And so in this instance, what we do here is we basically pick up with Hector Hammond. Now remember, Hector Hammond, for the most part, has kind of been a background character in a lot of what's been going on in the Green Lantern mythos, and rightfully so. The whole idea was to take these characters who had long since stood in the Green Lantern landscape and to keep them, you know, fresh in the minds of fans who have been reading Green Lantern for a long time, but to also say, yes, we have this great idea. We want to keep the stuff that works, but we also want to add to this. We want to build on top of this. Now, Hector Hammond, of course, as we've discussed before, has been a longtime villain of Hal Jordan, or at least had been for quite a while. But the idea behind Hector Hammond is he was just a guy who has telepathic powers and is essentially this idea that his powers are being kept in check. He's being uh, more or less kept hidden. And his origin goes into Green Lantern Rebirth, which we discussed. You guys are welcome to check that video down in the description. But the issue with this is that following the conclusion of Blackest Night, we essentially had the Parallax Entity take off and presumably attach itself to Hector Hammond, or at least that seemed to be the case. Now, that's not actually what's going on here. Instead, Hector Hammond is hearing a voice from another person. He's hearing a voice from another being that's just kind of floating out there. And ultimately it says, look, you've got friends everywhere, so on and so forth. And it essentially sticks like all these rats onto these guards and, and effectively takes these guards out. But what it does is it allows for the, the escape of Hector Hammond. Now, the funny thing about this too, is we also get to revisit the character of Larflees. Now remember, Larflees is like the comedic relief in a lot of ways, but, but don't be mistaken. Like, don't be fooled. While he is funny, Larflees is a beast. He's an absolute monster. And we'll find out just how insanely powerful he is as we go forward into the future of these Green Lantern stories. But the funny thing about this is, you remember, the Blackest Night event saw all these different lanterns kind of culminating onto Earth, the heads of the Lantern Corps. So that's really kind of what happened. And after Blackest Night was over, we immediately went into Brightest Day with the formation of this, of this White Lantern. And so it was really like, look, before you guys could take off, you guys have a task you need to perform. You guys need to find who's, who's kidnapping and taking all these entities. And so it is kind of cool because what ends up happening is there's basically a scene that's called, you know, there's this huge issue going on where a cop says, look, man, there's all this craziness happening around here. And when Hal Jordan's like, hey, does it look like this guy? He shows him a picture of Larflees and the cop's like, yep, that's exactly who he is. And then we basically end up having Hal Jordan traveling over to meet Larflees and Larflees is just hoarding everything. <laughs> It's like trees and like cars, everything that you can imagine he's been taking, like pinball machines and sweets, the whole nine yards. Because remember, Larflees is driven by greed. That's that's the motivating factor, avarice. That's all he wants to do is just get as much as he can. Mine, 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 mine. What's crazy here is that Larflees is trying to acquire as much stuff as possible. And Larflees has discovered commercials. Now in discovering commercials, Larflees has discovered that Earth houses a magical being who only goes around once a year and gives people their heart's desire. Yes, I'm talking about Santa Claus. <laughs> Larflees believes Santa Claus is real. And Larflees is like, I'm writing a letter to a letter to Santa because he'll give me my he'll give me everything that I want. And uh and and like I'll I'll have everything that I could ever want to have. And it's, it's it's almost kind of funny because Hal Jordan has to break the news to Larflees that Santa's not real. <laughs> But, but again, this is important because from here, it really kind of starts to branch out into things. It starts to grow into things. What we end up having here is, is we basically end up learning that Ophidian, the representation, the, the, the orange lantern entity is housed inside of Larflees' lantern, which is one of the reasons why he's so powerful is because every facet of the orange lantern concept is housed directly within the lantern of Larflees and he basically mainlines that power into himself. And so because of that, he's just insane because it's like having one green lantern that has all the powers of the green lantern and he can just use all that power to his own ends, make almost indestructible constructs, things like that. The problem with this is that we're met with the arrival of Hector Hammond, who, who basically swallows the orange lantern ring of Larflees. And when he does, he's effectively empowered by the Ophidian entity and becomes this kind of living embodiment of Ophidian. Now, the other half of this is it also hits at things like a person who's basically being tracked by the predator, the bull, uh, which is basically out there, you know, in Montana with regards to the red lanterns. I mean, all these things that are going on in terms of these entities, they're all for the most part housed on earth. Earth. And so as a result, when Hector Hammond basically becomes Ophidian, his initial response is, I want to find Carol Ferris. Now, this 
is interesting here because it's basically greed. Remember, greed is the overriding factor. And it really is intriguing because in this scenario, what we're actually going to find is there's a little bit of overlap. When it comes to greed and when it comes to love, oftentimes the two cross paths and it can be very difficult to differentiate between which one is motivated by the other. At this point, we switch over to uh, to Zamoran with the Star Sapphires. Now, remember, one thing I want to I want to kind of reiterate here is the nature of the Star Sapphires because this actually ties into what's happening at the moment. Uh, the idea of the Star Sapphires is they are basically women who had broken away from the original Guardians of the Universe and they had just kind of gone off on this you know escapade and kind of gone through this whole self discovering journey, different things like that. But they had basically discovered the ancient bodies of uh, Hawkman and Hawkwoman, and because of the fact that Hawkman and Hawkwoman are are destined to basically you know be born in physical form and then meet each other, fall in love, and then die, and then the process repeats itself, they represent undying love. The idea that from now until the end of the universe, they will always be destined to die and then be reborn and then meet and fall in love and die again. And so what the, the Star Sapphires did is they used that concept of love as the foundation for the energy of the Star Sapphires. Now they use that to kind of create their central power battery, so on and so forth. But the issue with this is that because of the events of Blackest Night and Brightest Day, Hawkman and Hawkwoman have been reborn. And so what that means is that their bodies aren't just kind of laying there. Their, their undying love can't be used as a source of energy anymore because they're alive now. They're actually out there now. So their corpses can't really be used as a source of energy because there's nothing left. And so the result is that it seems as though the Star Sapphire Central Power Battery is basically eroding because there's no more energy left for it to use. And so the idea is to say, we have to find the Predator. We have to find the entity of the Star Sapphires, the entity of love, and then confine it within the Central Power Battery and use that as a source of energy. Now, at this point, we pick up with Las Vegas, of course, Sin City. I'm really excited because I'm going to Las Vegas in like four days and I've never been before. So I'm really, really, I'm really excited. I'll probably post pictures on, on Instagram. Uh, make sure you guys follow me on Instagram at Comics Explained and make sure you follow me on Twitter at Comics Explained because I'll probably post pictures there too. But the fact remains that with regards to uh, Carol Ferris, she's basically instructed by uh, Queen Agapo of the Xamarons, look, the Predator is on Earth. Like your assignment is to find the Predator, to basically find a way to contain the Predator and bring the Predator back. And so it's kind of cool because what we end up doing is picking up with this guy who's basically obsessed with this girl. Now, here's the interesting thing is that this really is just a genuine obsession because what ends up happening here is this guy, Abraham Point, is met by the predator and the predator simply says, you feel great love for a girl that you've never met. So let's change that. And so literally the predator bonds with this guy and then takes off to meet this girl. Now, this is a little bit, I mean, if, if, if I'm going to go out on a limb here and I'm going to be a little bit dangerous and possibly throw some words in the mouth of Jeff Johns, this is like a life lesson on love because it's the question of what happens if you're in love with someone, but you never actually act on it and you never really talk to them. Are you in love or are you infatuated? But before we get into that, there's this massive panic that's going on in, in Las Vegas. Everything's kind of going crazy. Carol Ferris goes to check it out and Larflees is there. Now, why is this hilarious? Because he's celebrating the fact that he's in Vegas and Larflees has discovered an all-you-can-eat buffet. So... <laughs> He's just, he's ecstatic because it's like, you can have as much as you want. And he's like, yes, I can have as much as I want. Which of course, if this is Chinese food, that would definitely be amazing. Anything else? Well, I mean, you know, it kind of depends on what they serve. But as we all know, Chinese buffets are the best buffets. They are, they are so good. I'm, I'm getting hungry for a Chinese buffet right now. But in any event, getting back into our discussion about love, you know, our philosophical perspective about this, this is why this is so cool. Is because for a lot of people out there, the idea of love almost seems like this sort of concept that exists in some other dimensional realm. It's a thing they know of and it's a thing other people have somehow been able to acquire, but it's a thing that they themselves have not been able to gain. It's like this intangible concept. It's smoke slipping through their fingers. And so in a lot of ways, people just kind of watch from afar, but they never actually take that step and never actually say anything. And that's what's going on with this guy. That's what happened with Abraham Point, that he was truly, you know, he, at least he believed that he was genuinely in love with this girl. The irony of it all is she doesn't know who he is. And he, you know, he, he knows her by some means. It's never really explored but he's been watching her for quite some time. And so it's basically that idea that being in, in that kind of a mindset that's simply saying like, I'm in love with that person, but never taking the step to make your feelings known is wildly unhealthy because it puts you in a very negative mindset because at that point, then your imagination begins to run wild. And instead of simply, you know, envisioning all these flights of fantasy about the kind of life you can have together, well, then suddenly it starts to become unhealthy and it's, well, why isn't she saying anything to me? Is it because she doesn't like me? Well, if she doesn't like me, what's wrong with me? What's so messed up about me that, that she doesn't like me? And then suddenly it stops being 
between you being okay with yourself and it turns into there everything about me is wrong i've got to fix myself i've got to make myself better all because of the fact that you never went out there and said anything and i can say that because i've been there i've been down that road before and i know how unhealthy that mindset can be and that's the cool thing there's all these different little philosophical lessons that you can draw from jeff john's writing where he kind of says hey look this is the struggle of life the struggle of life is mustering up the courage to say something and so that's the idea behind this now of course with carol ferris's mindset she figures this out almost immediately she basically says look this guy believes he feels love and that's why he's basically being taken over by the predator is because he genuinely believes he loves that girl but he doesn't know what love is but everyone wants to be loved everybody in some form or fashion wants to be told i love you by someone who's not a member of their family they want to have that kind of butterfly in your stomach floating through the air they want to have that giddiness that excitement you know that kind of honeymoon phase when it comes to being in a relationship and because everyone wants that all this guy wants is to feel love even if it's only for a momentary second and that's what carol ferris gives him uh, she kisses him doesn't really give him much more than that but you know she kisses him and he feels love and in doing so the predator is removed in its entirety you know and as a result it, it doesn't really bond itself to carol ferris so much as she grabs a predator and they basically travel to zamora now the initial reaction here and this is kind of the cool concept is carol ferris's argument is look these entities are a byproduct of the being that wields them which is to say they take whatever experience they've had with that being and that starts to become a part of who they are the predator being a violent creature is because of the fact that it's its entire concept is mired in violence if the basis behind the predator's existence is the basis behind the star sapphire's existence and the basis behind the star sapphire's existence is the death and rebirth of hawkman and hawkwoman well then all this thing really knows is death all it really knows is like destruction and then love those two concepts kind of mingled together what it needs to know is true love it needs to know what love really is it needs to understand that concept and the only way for that to happen is for it to bond to a human host and so initially the other Zamorans are simply like no this can't happen like this thing has to be the source of our central power battery otherwise it can't function but notice this Carol Ferris's response is that's not true look at the Green Lanterns the Green Lanterns don't throw ion in the the central power battery like the central power battery for the Green Lanterns functions strictly on willpower all the willpower that exists out there in the universe is basically kind of drawn in and used by the central power battery and spread throughout the other Green Lanterns there's no reason to believe the Zamorans can't be the same way that the central power battery of the star sapphires will function based on all the love that exists in the universe and if it does then there's no need for the predator entity to be bonded to the central power battery that doesn't have to be part of the equation this is actually really really cool because what this does is it sets the stage for the possibility that carol ferris or anybody out there could become a host for the uh for the predator entity effectively making them into a star sapphire jeff johns is basically grabbing all these different entities bringing them in and then saying they exist outside of the central power battery i.e anybody can use them anybody can wield them anybody can become one of them if they're subjected to you know possession by this entity but it's cool because it's all this world building stuff it's expanding on these things and, and helping to sort of grow these different ideologies and so on and so forth but again when it comes to brightest day you have the main brightest day event but the green lantern tie-ins are actually more interesting they're actually a lot more intriguing in terms of how brightest day comes together you know, the one thing I hate the most about having the flu is my, my schedule gets all thrown off. And so it's like, okay, like I am in no condition to record. So whatever videos we have online, those videos are going out. And I don't even care if it matches the schedule or not. Like it's, it's, it's crazy. Like it is, it is rough, but we are finally back on track. We're finally back on our schedule. We're doing our Green Lanterns on Sundays. And uh, again, we're picking up with the, the Green Lantern line of stories as part of Brightest Day. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I mean, I'm gonna be honest here, guys. I actually like Green Lantern more than I like the main Brightest Day story. Now, a lot of that again is because of the fact that brightest day was designed to detail the 12 heroes 12 villains or what have you they came back to life after the events of blackest night but if those are characters that you were never really interested in in the first place the main story probably wouldn't intrigue you that much and so again because of the fact that the green lantern focuses on the lantern entities this is where all the world building is now remember we've basically fleshed out a couple things the first is that parallax the yellow lantern entity the entity of the sinestro core the being that possessed hal jordan during the events of emerald twilight that was only the first entity that we knew of and there were so many others to go over there was also the entity of the orange lantern that was basically uh, that was essentially possessed by hector hammond who was one of the most notable enemies of hal jordan now at the point right now hector hammond is still out there he's not been captured off panel or anything like that in terms of like hal jordan and those guys he's just still floating around out there and that's going to be kind of a, a a focal point of this story to a degree especially when it comes to the character of uh, of larflees but at this moment what we actually end up doing here is picking up with a prison in montana that's effectively just 
just kind of been totally obliterated and destroyed. And the way it's described here is that there was something that, that was akin to a bull that just kind of ran through this whole thing and tore everything up. They basically just started ripping the, the prison to pieces and all that kind of good stuff. And where the cops are kind of, you know, trying to figure out what's going on and where they're analyzing the situation and they're talking about how to take it out. What ends up happening is one of them describes it as a being that's made of like fire or something along those lines. And then Atrocitus shows up alongside Sinestro and says, that's because it's not fire, it's pure rage. Now remember, after the events of Blackest Night, what we kind of had were all these leaders of the Lantern Corps who showed up on Earth to fight Necron, the leader of the Black Lanterns. And following Necron's defeat, we basically had the White Lantern that showed up. And because the White Lantern was there, what it meant is that everybody was kind of curious about it. At the same time, you had the White Lantern that was uh, essentially like issuing orders to like Hal Jordan and Sinestro and Carol Ferris of the Star Sapphires and essentially saying, you have to find the entities. And so it was kind of a way to keep the various leaders of the Lantern Corps confined to Earth to kind of keep them there. While some may have strayed, they ultimately came back and it was designed to basically bring them all together for a singular cause. And that's really where this was. You know, that, that, that was really the basis behind this. It's fleshing out all these entities, these beings that are kind of like a representation of the emotional spectrum. Now remember, they're not the sum total of the emotional spectrum. Like the, the bull is not the sum total of all energy of rage. It's just the representation of rage. It's kind of one of those interesting metaphysical things, but it does serve its purpose because one of the things that happens here is the character of Atrocitus. And this was not necessarily designed to be a kind of rework of his character, which is to say it wasn't really like turning the character of Atrocitus into a hero. What it was designed to do in a lot of ways was flesh his character out. Now, the reason I say that is, remember, when Atrocitus first showed up in the Green Lantern line of comics, he was just a raging monster in a lot of different ways. And the reason why was because his people had been totally obliterated by the Manhunters, the robots designed by the Guardians of the Universe, uh, who were ultimately decommissioned and replaced with the Green Lanterns to police the universe. But because of that, Atrocitus has always had a hatred for the Guardians of the Universe themselves, but he was almost always driven by, like, rage and anger. But ever since he learned of the bull, basically the entity that represents rage in the emotional spectrum, he's been constantly seeking after it. And whether it's because of this sort of focal point, which is to say he can kind of channel all of his energies and all of his thoughts into finding this one thing, or if it's because he's been working alongside Hal Jordan and he's worked alongside Sinestro and he's got other Lantern Corps members that he's been working with, for whatever reason, he's experiencing a kind of shift of sorts in the sense that there's basically this bus full of, uh, of, of prisoners and he effectively kills them all. He annihilates them all in their entirety. And when the question is asked by Sinestro, why would you do this? Atrocitus' response is because those who would take life don't deserve deserve it. You know, they, they basically deserve to lose theirs. Individuals who would bring harm or bring pain and suffering to innocent people don't deserve to live. Now, this is kind of funny because this does fit into Atrocitus. It's not like, you know, Jeff Johns took a huge paradigm shift. Atrocitus's motivation, while it was predicated on the loss of his family and his desire is to take out the Guardians and the Green Lanterns, it's not just a desire to kill. But for the most part, he believes he'll, he'll bring peace to the universe. That if he eliminates the Guardians of the universe, if he eliminates the Green Lanterns, these kind of agents for the Guardians' schemes and motivation, with the uh, really with Atrocitus knowing a lot of the things that the Green Lanterns don't. In his mind, he's basically allowing people to live their own lives outside of the invisible and oftentimes subtle control of the Guardians themselves. So he's not really a villain. Now, his actions in terms of attacking Green Lanterns and killing them, things like that, that could be construed as being villainous depending on how you view the Green Lanterns. And that's something I want you guys to keep in mind because as we progress throughout Jeff John's run, what we're going to do is we're going to start to make this shift, this kind of transition between the Green Lanterns being just holy good guys to where we we start to look at the Green Lanterns with a bit of a skewed eye, and especially the Guardians of the Universe, where it's like, are they really the heroes that we always thought they were? But at this point, we switch back to Zamoron. Now, remember, in the last video, we had talked about how the uh, entity that represents the Star Sapphires is the Predator. And because all these entities were on Earth, and because all these entities had kind of just escaped, or at least people became aware of their presence following the arrival of the uh, White Lantern, what we basically had is kind of this gold rush for the respective Lantern Corps to track down their entities. And Carol Ferris had effectively come across the Predator and then in turn brought the Predator back to Zamorod. But the idea was that the central power battery kind of ran on the Predator, more or less. But when the Predator had effectively left, when that energy had escaped and the Predator had arrived on Earth, the belief of the Star Sapphires was, well, it's only a matter of time before we use up all the energy in the central power battery. But this is when Carol Ferris came along and said, that's not true. Like every other Lantern core that exists out there, the central power battery, the central point by which you guys as Star Sapphires derive your power, that's all based on the emotional aspect of love. And so long as 
as there is love in the universe, there will always be energy in the Star Sapphire central power battery. And so at that point, the question became, what do we do with the Predator? In the dying moments of the former queen, Queen Agapo of the uh, Star Sapphires, she had basically made Carol Ferris the new queen. And so what this means is that Carol Ferris now leads the Star Sapphires. But the idea here is that, again, what seems to be hinting at here is that it, you know Carol Ferris may very well bond with the entity itself. That we're not 100% sure about. I mean, at this, at this point, we're not really given an answer. Instead, you know, she just kind of takes off with the entity. And when Hal Jordan says, when are you going to be back? She says, when the job is done, which of course is the same answer that Hal Jordan always gave Carol whenever he took off. But at this point, we switch over to Michigan and we basically pick up with a young girl who had effectively just gone missing. It's basically the idea that Nicole had been taken captive uh, by some guy. But it's interesting because this girl basically says, I forgive you for the things that you've done. And, you know, I hope that you forgive me for what I'm about to do. But I've always been told you have to forgive those that do wrong. And that's what's so cool about this is because she immediately topples this guy, you know, immediately, you know, throws soup at him and, and you know, essentially tries to make her escape and subdue him. But then she's suddenly met by the arrival of Adara, the Blue Lantern entity. And this is cool because the way this girl talked, when she said, I forgive you for the things that you've done, you know, it's very much Blue Lantern like because it's really more about like inner peace, because it's really more about finding a kind of place within yourself where you find a measure of contentment and you find hope. That's exactly what Nicole's found. And of course, she ends up becoming a uh, becoming a host for Adara, the Blue Lantern entity. Now, at this point, we switch back over to Larflees. And this is why I say this is where the story kind of begins to emphasize the nature of Larflees with regards to uh, Hector Hammond. Remember, when it comes to the various Lantern cores that are out there, they have a central power battery. And a central power battery is, is exactly what it sounds like. It's a giant, you know, lantern, more or less, in the color of whatever core it represents. But the idea is that it's kind of like a consolidation factory. All the emotion that belongs to that one particular lantern core is kind of consolidated inside the central power battery. It's sort of funneled into that battery itself, or at least the battery draws on that part of the emotional spectrum. And from there, all that energy is just divvied out among the various lanterns that exist out there. But remember, the amount of energy any one lantern can use is, is, is essentially based on how many lanterns are out there. So while there is a lot of energy that's there, one of the things that was established when it came to Larflees, the orange lantern, is that with the green lanterns, you have like 3,600 lanterns that are out there. And so you have all this energy split among 3,600 people. Well, what happens when you have all, all that energy that goes into one person? That's how it works with Larflees. Larflees is the orange lantern, the orange lantern of greed, of avarice. And so instead of having like a huge central power battery that anybody can locate and anybody can tap into, instead, it's just his little battery that he keeps confined to himself and that Ophidian, the orange lantern entity, was confined in. Now, of course, with Hector Hammond consuming that, that lantern, all that energy is now in him. And what it means is the power of uh, Larflees is slowly starting to drain. And this is pretty significant because as a lantern based on greed, he wants as much as he can possibly have. He's literally just a hoarder. And so because of that, when his, lan when his lantern power starts to dissipate, it's crushing because now his self-identity begins to go away. Now, in truth, if the orange lantern was removed from Larflees for any real measure of time, let's say for like a few weeks or a few months, he would revert back to his normal state. He would no longer be governed by like greed or anything along those lines, or at least that's that's how I would interpret it. I wouldn't think that would be the case. But regardless of the scenario, with his power effectively waning, he's been tasked with kind of keeping an eye on a guy named Abraham, who is basically the host for the Predator entity when it first popped up on Earth before Carol Ferris took it to uh, to Zamora. And it is kind of cool here because what we end up finding out is that one, Larflees is not the actual name of this guy. And two, his family's still alive and they still miss him to a degree. Now, Larflees has for the most part cast off his former identity. He's basically basically just become the person he is now and almost doesn't want to go back to the person that he was before. But it is kind of cool because when he goes to attack Abraham, of course, how Jordan shows up and how Jordan says, look, we can't have this. You need to calm down. You need to chill. We're here to protect this guy for, you know, whatever reason, whatever the motivation is. But in the middle of this conflict they're having, they're suddenly met by the arrival of St. Walker, or at least by a message from St. Walker. Now, the funny thing about this is St. Walker basically grabs him and says, Adara has arrived. Adara has chosen a host. Now, remember, when it comes to a person becoming a Blue Lantern, that's not something that's just readily done. It's a huge, like, trial. Like, you're put through all these trials and all these tribulations, and they hardcore test your metal. That's why you don't have 3,600 blue lanterns running around. At most, you have, like, five. But the fact that Adara has chosen a host is very interesting, because Adara is kind of designed to be this sort of harbinger for how it is the blue lanterns choose. And so, if Adara has chosen a host, it means Adara has essentially searched throughout all however many billions of people on Earth and settled on one person, the person best suited to instill hope in others. Of course, that person being Nicole. And so it's, it's awesome because for the Blue Lanterns, it's a time of celebration. It's a time to kind of look around and say, this is what we've been striving for all this time is to find Adara. And then in turn, see if we can't find a way to use that energy to bolster the power of the Blue Lanterns, or at the very least, to find a way to consolidate that energy into ourselves.
themselves. So it is kind of cool because in this moment, Adara begins to sort of analyze the various people who were here. She analyzes Larflees, for example, and says, your parents are still alive and your parents still miss you. Why do you choose to live this life of a, of a you know, orange lantern where you're so full of like a void, a void that can never truly be filled? If you let this go and you go back to your family, you'll find the life that you've been searching for. With Hal Jordan, it's a lot more interesting. You know, the idea is that she analyzes Hal Jordan and says, you are filled with hope, but for whatever reason, you won't allow yourself to feel it. Like you won't allow yourself to be full of hope. You're afraid of hope. Why are you afraid of hope? Now, if I'm gonna be honest with you guys, I would look at Hal Jordan and I would say he's afraid of hope because of what could happen. Hal Jordan at one point was, was hopeful. He was a guy who was full of hope, full of beautiful tomorrows and you know, who knows what'll happen and who knows what the future will bring, but it'll definitely be brighter than today. And then like Coast City was destroyed and then he was possessed by the Parallax entity. And then he wiped out all the Green Lanterns and killed all the Guardians of the Universe except one. And then he waged war against the entirety of the DC Universe, crushed Superman, defeated all the superheroes and tried to blink reality out of existence. And him being possessed by Parallax is predicated on the idea that he lost what he loved. He lost hope basically. And so if he goes back to being hopeful, allowing himself to care about things again, he makes himself pray for Parallax. And that's what's kind of interesting because while we end up having, you know, Adara who looks to be like converting Hal Jordan into a Blue Lantern, suddenly the two of them are severed. The two of them are separated. And the reason why is because they're met by the arrival of the Flash. And the Flash simply says, we have to talk about the friends that you're spending time with. We have to talk about the people that you're keeping company with. And we have to talk about that right now. Okay, so continuing our discussions on Green Lantern, uh, at this point, it's actually really, really cool. This is why I love the Green Lantern tie-in for Brightest Day. I think it's better than like the actual main Brightest Day story. But basically what we do is we pick up with the rise of Parallax slash God Flash. I think it's actually really, really cool in terms of how this goes. Now, uh, initially this picks up with a, really with like a few paramedics. Really, it's kind of like the aftermath, it seems, of what went on with Atrocitus where he, you know, the leader of the Red Lantern Corps just kind of went crazy and like killed a bunch of people, stuff like that. But it is kind of interesting because in the middle of all this, they're effectively involved in a car wreck and where one of them seems to die, they're met by the arrival of the Indigo Tribe. Now, remember, when it comes to the Green Lantern mythos, the Indigo Tribe is one of several Lantern Corps that are out there. And when it comes to the various Lantern Corps, one thing to keep in mind is basically the phrase Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. That's the colors of the various Lantern Corps that are out there. The Indigo Tribe is the most ambiguous. It's, it's really the one that we don't know that much about. And they were designed to be that way really for a long time. It really wouldn't be until uh, I think after like New 52 that DC actually explained the origins of the Indigo Tribe but they're also here with the Black Hand. Now remember when it comes to William Hand he really had like his biggest moment uh, well really had a lot of big moments but he was one of those characters that Jeff Johns kind of brought back with regards to the Green Lantern mythos and then started rolling him over into like these small little tidbit cameos. He would show up here he would show up there he'd be a villain of the Flag, or I'm sorry of the Green Lantern for a little while and then it all basically culminated in the rise of Necron the head of the Black Lantern it's basically the Lord of the Dead, quote unquote, or at least one of the many aspects of death that exists out there. But the idea was that with William Hand, because he was obsessed with death, he was kind of like the harbinger for Necron, meaning that he was the one that basically started kind of expelling these different rings and kind of bringing the dead to life and sort of laying the groundwork for Necron showing up inside the main DC universe. But following the events of Blackest Night, William Hand found some measure of redemption. That's really what this is in the sense that he just becomes part of the Indigo tribe. Now remember, this is the hunt for the various entities that exist out there. These physical representations of the different aspects of the emotional spectrum. And so when it comes to the Indigo tribe, their entity is proselyte. At least I think that's how you pronounce it. It's basically them kind of showing up and telling this paramedic who's really on his deathbed, you know, on the moments when he's going to die and essentially say, you've been chosen to be the host for proselyte, the entity of the Indigo tribe. And so at this point, we switch over to the last video that we left off at, where we basically had Flash throw up and confront Green Lantern. And this is cool because remember, these two go way back. I mean, they really have an extremely lengthy history together. And a lot of that goes back to the events before Crisis on Infinite Earths in the sense that, you know, they'd really kind of like been teammates for quite some time and so on and so forth. They'd been on the Justice League and they'd fought together in various team up issues and so on and so forth. But their friendship goes back quite a way. And the result is that when it comes to Barry Allen really showing up on the doorstep of, uh, of Hal Jordan, the question is, why are you working alongside these other lanterns? Now, remember, when it comes to like the Green Lantern Hal Jordan in terms of how he's perceived by Barry Allen, Barry Allen has been absent from the DC landscape for around 20 years. And so all he 
calls about Hal Jordan is the old Hal Jordan, the way he used to be. Back when he was a Green Lantern and it was just, I'm the good guy, they're the bad guys, and I never work alongside them. Now, where the events of Blackest Night and the rise of all these Black Lanterns did require the various superheroes to work alongside all these other Lantern Corps, in the eyes of Barry Allen, it's kind of like, hey, look, that was like a huge universe shifting calamity. Like, it was the end, it was the end times. Like, the end was nigh. So we just kind of had to do what we had to do in order to pull it all off. But at this point, Barry Allen's sort of stance is that Blackest Night is over. The War of the Lantern Corps doesn't really exist anymore. And so as a result, like, there should be no reason why you're allying yourself with these various Lantern Corps, especially when you have the head of the Red Lanterns, Atrocitus, killing like three busloads of prisoners. There's no reason for you to be doing this. Now, when the question is asked, why are you allying yourself with these guys? Hal Jordan actually comes back with a pretty reasonable response, where you guys could bring in telepaths, where you guys could bring in various people that have different abilities, you know, empaths and so on and so forth, and where they could track down these Lantern entities. At the end of the day, this is kind of in-house. And that's really sort of reminiscent of how DC treats the Green Lantern. For the most part, the Green Lantern is kept kind of isolated from everything else that's going on. It ties in and it crosses over, but just because you see something in Green Lantern doesn't mean it's an absolute. It's just so wildly popular, or at least it was at the time this was being done, that the Green Lantern line of stories were just kind of, do what you want, Jeff Johns, and you know, we won't really bat an eye so long as the sales keep coming in and the stories keep making, you know, keep making bank. And so the result is that it's kind of an comic book representation of that concept in the sense that Green Lantern could just kind of do whatever he wanted to. But it is interesting because the idea of, of Hal Jordan is saying, look, these entities represent an incredible level of power and we're keeping this in-house because we're really the only ones who are capable of tracking them adequately and handing them over to where they need to go. And that makes sense because there's no guarantee that if Hal Jordan went to the Justice League and I don't want to bring in like any of the other Lantern Corps, so I need your all's help, there's no guarantee the Justice League wouldn't then turn around and say, okay, we found Parallax, time to like put him in a jar and keep him there forever. There's no guarantee they would be able to handle it adequately because as far as Hal Jordan is concerned, the Justice League doesn't truly understand the emotional spectrum. They're not part and parcel to the emotional spectrum. They don't know the ins and outs of how the whole Lantern mythos works, but Hal Jordan does. And so it makes sense that with all the information that's held by the various Lantern cores that are out there, Sinestro and the Yellow Lanterns, Atrocitus and the Red Lanterns, it makes sense that all that would be kept in house, that it would basically sort of be isolated from the Justice League themselves. But it's not without merit and it's not without note because Barry Allen really kind of feels a measure of betrayal here where it's kind of like, yeah, but like we're your friends. But for Hal Jordan, it's a lot more personal than that because while it is kind of kept in house, the idea is that when it comes to these entities, those individuals who are possessed by them are basically being gripped with a level of power they can't really begin to comprehend. And that's what Hal Jordan brings up. He basically says, hey, look, you were effectively dead or locked in the speed force or what have you, but you weren't here when I was possessed by Parallax. When I came home from space, you know, from a mission and I found out Coast City had been destroyed, that opened the doorway for Parallax to seize hold of me for fear of losing everybody else. I became this universe level threat. I tried to destroy everything in existence. When it comes to all those things, Hal Jordan's stance is you weren't here for all that. So you don't understand the impact that being possessed by one of these entities has. And so that's what's kind of cool about this. It's because Barry's initial response is, no, I'm not going to. Like, I'm going to stand here staunchly and we're going to find a way to work this out. So again, it is kind of interesting. Now, I would argue in terms of like the way that Barry Allen's done here, it's almost kind of like making up for lost time, right? Like trying to be more of a superhero than he really needs to be. It's kind of like, hey, look, just to show you how good of a superhero I am, we're going to solve this together, whether you want to or not. But in the middle of all this, Barry basically finds out that his wallet was stolen by Larflees, <laughs> by the Orange Lantern of Greed. Again, this is why I love Lar Fleece. It's those small little moments here and there that make things so amazing. But again, this is all kind of taking place with the arrival of Nicole, which is to say the girl who's possessed by the Blue Lantern entity. And so with them having this debate and having this discussion, they're met by the arrival of the Indigo tribe. Now, again, this is kind of cool because one of the things that's hit at here and one of the things that seems to be indicated is that where you have various Lantern cores out there, for the most part, most of the Lantern cores kind of allow you to pick and choose whether or not you want to wield the ring. For example, if you're sitting at home one day and a Green Lantern ring pops up and it says you have the ability to overcome great fear, welcome to the Green Lantern Corps, you can say no and the ring will search for somebody else. It'll say, okay, cool. And it'll go out and it'll find a different host due to the fact that you rejected it. When it comes to the Red Lanterns, it doesn't work that way. It's basically, you know, you have great rage in your heart, you belong to the Red Lantern Corps and it will forcefully try to bond itself to you. One of the things that's hit at when it comes to this Indigo tribe is they seem very similar to the Star Sapphires in the sense that the Star Sapphire uh, Lantern Corps basically sort of exists to convert people 
forcefully. The star sapphires essentially go around and they say, this person has experienced great love. This person has experienced great loss by extension of the love they felt. And so we are going to basically induct them into the star sapphires, whether they want to be or not. We've seen that with like the uh, the, the yellow lanterns, for example, right? You know, I mean, during the whole Sinestro core war, the star sapphires grab members of the Sinestro core and then encase them in star sapphire crystal and try to convert them. For some of them, it worked. For some of them, it didn't. When it comes to this indigo tribe, it almost seems to be very similar to that in the sense that the way the indication is given off in terms of speculation from St. Walker, as well as Nicole herself being possessed by the, you know, the, the blue lantern entity is that when it comes to William Hand, Hal Jordan's stance is just because of the fact that you found some measure of redemption by essentially feeling compassion and being bonded with a, a you know, an indigo ring doesn't exonerate you of all the past crimes that you've committed where William Hand basically says, yes, but I've been born again. You know, I've been baptized in the fires of compassion and I've, I've come out anew. The stance here is that, well, maybe it's one of those things where like, because of the fact that the blue lantern says none of these people feel hope. Maybe it's one of those where like the, the indigo tribe ring basically just takes over them. It replaces all the other emotions with nothing but compassion. And so in a sense, if you were to remove that ring, what would they turn into? Would they go back to their normal selves? And that's the question how Jordan asks to indigo, uh, you know, indigo one, if you feel compassion by extension of this ring and this ring effectively forces you to feel compassion, then if I were to take you and I were to remove you from the influence of the indigo tribe, what would you become? And so again, that's the whole idea of kind of feeding into the nature and the, you know, the ambiguity of the, uh, of the indigo tribe. And we'll find out when it comes to her origin and how it was that she came to be, which is actually pretty tragic. But again, it's somewhat cool because where the groups begin coming to blows in the sense that a fight is inevitably going to break out just from all these differing opinions and so on and so forth, they're met by the arrival of this, this mysterious being. And this is just a cloaked guy that's kind of been floating around ever since the, the conclusion of Blackest Night. We don't know where he's coming from. We don't know what his motivation is. All we know is that this guy has been basically going around and capturing various entities or whatever entities he could. And so he effectively shows up here with the parallax entity. And where the initial response is that it's supposed to go for Hal Jordan, what we end up learning is that it's not. Instead, the parallax entity is going for the Flash Barry Allen, which it possesses. And Barry Allen looks absolutely amazing. But basically, it's all the powers of the Flash bolstered by all the energy and all the evil of parallax himself. It's pretty sweet. All right, so continuing on with Green Lantern Sunday, which we've been doing this for what feels like forever, we have Parallax Flash versus Hal Jordan. It is, man, it's a sight to behold. <laughs> it's pretty amazing because it's all the powers of the Flash combined with like the wrath of Parallax, right? Like that's what's so cool about this. Parallax is the fear entity, like amplifies the energies of others, but for the most part, he's just like the representation of fear. But, but like Flash as Parallax looks amazing. But notice this, this is like a personal battle between these guys. What's so cool about this is that if you guys, you know, if, if, when we went over like uh, the, the secret origin of Hal Jordan, originally in 1993, Hal Jordan went crazy after Coast City was destroyed and he declared himself Parallax. And that was it. Jeff Johns came along and said, actually, he was possessed by the Parallax entity. We just didn't know it. And that's what's so cool is because Hal Jordan knows Parallax like intimately. I mean, they know each other in and out. Parallax knows what terrifies Hal Jordan the most, but Hal Jordan knows the weakness of Parallax. The problem with this is that the powers of the Flash come into this. And that's what's so cool is because this is a friend of Barry Allen. I'm sorry, a friend of Hal Jordan. And that's why Parallax possessing one of the members of the Justice League or something like that is such a cool situation. But the conversations between these two characters, and that's what makes it so interesting. The conversation between these two characters are so intriguing because one of the things Parallax says is like, my ability to possess Barry Allen allows me to like communicate with the Speed Force. What would happen if Parallax infiltrated the Speed Force? Like if he, if he managed to like corrupt the Speed Force, what would that Speed Force look like? And that's why things like this are so cool because it kind of asks these questions no one ever considered before like nobody ever thought about before you know that's what's so interesting about this like it's, it's just one of these really cool situations where it's just like man like for, okay for example like it's nothing to do with the story i am considering a topic for a batman story like I'm, I'm trying to flesh out a batman story there is a moment with alfred where like if it goes as planned people are gonna like turn the page you're gonna be like oh my god like there is it's gonna be insane they're gonna be like what it's gonna be one of those crazy crazy moments but like that's the kind of thing like these scenarios that people never think of, that people never consider, that never crosses their mind. That's what makes these stories so cool. But for Parallax, it's not just you're a character there, like you're a person that I'm fighting. It's you are Hal Jordan. Like I want you back because remember Parallax was brought here. You know, that mysterious short guardian person, the person that we have no idea who it is at the moment. We know who it is now in real life, but like living in the immersion, we don't know who that person is. And in that instance with Parallax showing up, like wanting to repossess Hal Jordan,
Jordan. It's so cool because it's like, this is where I belong. Like I belong in Hal Jordan. Like that's where I'm supposed to be. And it's cool because Parallax exists to spread fear. That's all it is. And when Hal Jordan was possessed by Parallax, he tried to blink the universe out of existence and bring it back during zero hour crisis in time. The closest Parallax ever got to spreading fear across the cosmos. I would say the peak of him was when he possessed Hal Jordan. And so it makes the most sense that he would want to go back and possess Hal Jordan again. And that's all this really is. It's the whole whole idea of like, I want to repossess you. And Hal Jordan finally picks up on that. Hal Jordan finally realizes that like, you want to possess me, so then possess me. And initially Parallax goes to do that, but this guardian jumps in the way, or this, this person jumps in the way. He says he's not a guardian, but you know, he jumps in the way and says, Parallax, stop. You are not here to attack Hal Jordan. You're not here to possess him or anything like that. You're here to do my bidding. You are here to do a job that I have, that I've assigned you to. And when the intention of this, of this guardian guy is to to destroy Hal Jordan, suddenly we end up having like all these lantern cores start jumping in. You have like the Indigo Tribe, you have the Blue Lanterns, you have Larflees that shows up. It's cool because remember, while this whole thing is going on, everyone's hunting for the entities. A lot of them have already been found, but everyone's hunting for all the others. They're trying to locate them and trying to figure out where they're at. But at this point, we switch over to uh, to Sinestro and to Atrocitus because remember, they're on the hunt for the Butcher, which is the Red Lantern entity. And the funny thing about this is that Sinestro is going, you know, allying himself with Atrocitus for no other reason than the fact that like hey look maybe somebody worse than us will get the get the entities and that's a problem so like i'd rather be you know on the devil's right hand than in his path and so we are going to ally ourselves with atrocitus and do what we need to do the problem with this is that romar 2 one of the yellow lanterns caught it kind of calls him up and says hey man the weaponer that made your yellow lantern ring originally he's got your daughter on cord because remember saronic natu she bailed out on the lantern course and like took off left and went to go be her own lantern and so the result is that at this point in time she's sitting you know in court she's sitting in the antimatter universe and then like this guy's like hey man this guy demands your presence and it's like all right look that's that's probably the worst thing you could have said was like my presence is demanded because the coolest thing about sinestro more than like how he fights hal jordan more than him creating his own lantern core all that kind of stuff is his arrogance like he's one of those characters where like normally i don't dig arrogance but like for me like you look at sinestro and it's like yeah man like he's arrogant and really cocky and it's amazing like it's it's so cool because like he's one of the characters like like and i don't know how many of you guys for those of you guys who are not not like lantern fans if you're stumbling across this video there are people who love sinestro like they are huge fans of sinestro actually i'm, I'm curious now that we say it who is your favorite lantern like who's your favorite lantern of all the lanterns that exist out there i don't care about the course who is your favorite lantern like is it hal jordan is it barry allen you know i guess when he was a blue lantern is it you know um atrocitus of the red lanterns like post and let me know because i'm i'm really kind of curious but this is intriguing because in the middle of all this we end up having this guardian just kind of show up and when the question is asked like who are you and why are you here initially he doesn't answer Answer. You know, it's, it's kind of intriguing because one of the things that happened here was that this guardian sort of taking off was done at the hand of Larflees, right? Like Larflees is the orange lantern. Remember, when it comes to all the other lantern cores, the green lanterns and the indigo tribe and the blue lanterns and yada, 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 and so on, you have the emotion of hope or rage or what have you that's spread across all these individuals. With Larflees, it's not like that. It channels directly into him, meaning he has the power of a thousand lanterns. And that's what this does. The, the, the guy conjures a construct, this like this massive construct and just smashes the guardian with it. And it's so cool because initially Hal Jordan, you know, contacts the Blue Lanterns, contacts St. Walkers and say, look, man, I need your help, man. Like things are popping off. Everything's starting to go crazy. And then like, here comes Larflees out of nowhere, like out of, dude, RKO out of nowhere, just like smashes this guy. And it's the coolest thing because it's just like, dude. And this is, this, see, this is why it's so cool to me because like when I read this originally, it was my first time reading it. And it was probably like seven months ago. It was my first time reading it. And like, I'm, I'm seeing this stuff that people have known for years. And it's just like, this is what you guys have been reading. Reading, I've been missing out, man. But it's so interesting because what this guardian does is he pops back up onto the scene and says, you guys have served your purpose. This was all part of the plan. You didn't defeat me. You didn't somehow swindle me into a trap. Like you've done everything that I wanted you to do. And what I wanted you to do was take every single person who was possessed by an entity and locate them in one place. Because in turn, what he does is snatch the entities out of every single one of those guys. And so this one person is now in possession of all the lantern entities that we've discovered so far and the result is that when the question is asked yet again who are you like why are you here we end up finding out that this guy stands apart from the guardians of the of the universe he's not one of them but he was at one point in time this guy is krona and this is cool the you know the guardian that looked back at the beginning of everything and witnessed the creation of the universe and set the entirety of the lantern core and really like good and evil and the whole nine yards set it all in motion this guy is the one who's responsible for the creation of the multiverse notice this though this is something i want you guys to really 
really notice here there's the hand in the window that's that's old that's that's old school content that's back in the day that's og double og content that is back in like the secret origin really even way back then you know when when uh when when crisis on infinite earth happened is when that was revealed but that hand right there i still say to this day that's the hand of dr manhattan that's the hand of dr manhattan creating the entirety of the universe i say he made it man I say Dr. Manhattan made the universe. I'm going to stick with that until DC releases the story and we find out he didn't. But I'm very sure he did. In which case, now we got to call him Papa Manhattan. We got to call it like, okay, Papa Manhattan, like, like whatever you want us to do, man, like we go clean our room. But it's, it's cool. Like this, this is a great story. Like this is why I love this stuff so much. This Green Lantern stuff by Jeff Johns is, is just criminally good. I mean, it's, 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 it's stupid how good it is and how interesting it all comes together. Okay. So picking back up with uh, the Green Lantern Brightest Day, we pick up with the Red Lantern God or the Red Lantern Entity. I like calling them Red Lantern Gods. I think there's, I think, I think calling them gods are kind of cool, but technically they're entities. Uh, but again, you know, we, it's actually been a couple of weeks. Uh, of course, you know, we had like Emerald City Comic Con, and then I came down with a really with like a really bad bout of food poisoning and so on. But we're back into the swing of things. So of course we'll have this, and we'll have X Men that comes out later on today. But for those of you guys who have who have forgotten a little bit about what we talked about, or who aren't really caught up, or who are new here to my channel, the idea is that you have these entities and that, that's really what's taking place in this is that somebody's rounding up the entities the the general gist or at least what was told to us at the end of blackest night was that life on earth is really where like all life began and so the various entities represent these parts of the emotional spectrum you know like fear and rage and greed and different things like that and that these all just sort of coalesce and came into existence you know rage for example came into existence the first time that like an organism killed another organism on earth out of rage and like fear happened you know fear came into existence since the first time that the first organism on earth felt fear this is the kind of thing that took place like over the course of like all life across the cosmos this is how these things began to grow and how these um this, these parts of the emotional spectrum began to expand now what we also knew or at least what we were we were told anyway is that all these lantern entities existed on earth we just didn't know where and in fact this was a new thing by jeff johns we knew that like parallax was the entity or the you know the god so to speak for the uh, for the yellow lantern core but parallax had long since been established in dc comics and so that wasn't a very new thing but the other entities cropping up here this was all basically fleshed out by john simply saying like they all arrive here on earth and atrocitus the head of the red lantern corps is basically looking for the butcher which is the red lantern entity because of the fact that atrocitus being able to locate the things he wants or really locating the entity itself requires a sacrifice of blood basically what he does is he kills people but again this is one of the things that we've talked about in the previous videos that atrocitus is very much a conflicted character he's very much a character who's stuck in this interesting position because he's not really like a villain. I mean, he is a villain in the traditional sense, you know, in the idea that, like, he commits terrible things, but his motivation is to take out the Guardians of the Green Lanterns, but he does value innocent life. And in fact, we're going to see how far his conviction goes in this particular story. But basically, one of the first things he does is kill a couple people in cop cars. <laughs> That's one of the first thing he does is kill people. And then, of course, basically, you know, try to locate where the, where the butcher is at, where the Red Lantern entity is. Now, from here, we switch over to a guy by the name of Joshua Hayes. And Joshua Hayes is basically a guy here who stands convicted for the murder of a young girl. And what he ends up doing is actually taunting the father, which is pretty sadistic. Now, again, these entities go after individuals who basically imbue what it is they stand for. So in this instance, what ends up happening is a guy named James is actually tormenting this guy, or I guess, uh, I'm sorry, Joshua is tormenting this guy, James, James being the father of this girl, Elizabeth, who was killed. And where Joshua basically gives him a hard time and, you know, uh, does everything he can to, to basically drive this guy up the wall to kind of drive him nuts, they're suddenly met with the arrival of the butcher who comes showing up in really in no uncertain terms just kind of comes smashing through a wall but where we would expect that joshua would be the one who would be possessed because he was just so evil so vindictive so full of rage and so full of anger the rage of the father of elizabeth actually trumps that and that's why this is cool again this is the idea of jeff john's writing green lantern is it ties in like these emotional themes you know no pun intended with the overall idea of the green lantern mythos it ties in like these emotional themes these convictions that these people are really just genuinely filled with rage and the butcher goes out after James. Now, in the middle of all this, really when this starts to happen, the specter suddenly shows up. Now, here's the funny thing about this. The specter and the butcher, at least in terms of this immediate situation, almost seem to represent the same thing. The butcher represents like rage and vengeance, really rage more so than vengeance. But like in this instance, the butcher is possessing James because James is so filled with rage. And in turn, it will allow James to get vengeance on Joshua for killing his daughter. But the specter is the living embodiment of God's vengeance. It's almost as though the, the specter is kind of in this position of, look, you're in 
encroaching on my territory. Now, the Spectre knows about the Butcher, and he has known it for quite some time. We found that out in Blackest Night, but it is intriguing, because what ends up happening is the, the Spectre actually sort of starts to, to, to fight with the Butcher and actually try to destroy the Entity. Now, remember, these Entities can be destroyed. I mean, they're not immutable forces. It's not like, you know, if you destroy them, they'll, they'll come back or something along those lines. They're basically gone once they're dead. But the fact remains here, with this particular scenario, this is where the things sort of share a common ground, in the sense that the Butcher is, is essentially like in this massive fight with, with the Spectre. And again, it is it is pretty interesting and it's kind of cool. But then suddenly you have the arrival of Atrocitus. Now again, Atrocitus isn't really here to pick a fight with the Spectre himself. And in all honesty, I haven't really read of an instance where like Atrocitus and the Spectre have fought in terms of, a, of the Spectre in his current form and Atrocitus in his current form. Uh, that's not to say that fight doesn't exist. It's simply that I haven't read it yet. So I mean, it may be further on down the line in the Green Lantern mythos or simply just part of a story that I haven't, that I haven't caught up with yet. I would probably argue that Atrocitus wouldn't win against the Spectre, but maybe he will, you know, maybe, maybe he does. Again, I'm, I'm not going to swear to that. I'm not going to take it as an absolute. But again, you know, the, the Butcher basically possessing James actually sees James take on this pretty wicked form. And again, that's par for the course. That's what we've seen with the Lantern entities. When the entities possess a living host, that living host goes on to basically take on a, a kind of humanoid form representative of like whatever it is that Lantern entity stands for, as well as something that just absolutely looks boss. And like James looks like a beast. Like it's, it's pretty solid <laughs> to see him in this form. But the Spectre kind of has this sort of internal monologue, or at least a discussion of sorts with James, you know, with, with the role they play, even with Atrocitus himself. Because of the fact that the Spectre is the living embodiment of, of vengeance, the Spectre kills regularly. That's the role it serves. I mean, it's it was designed for the purpose of killing things. But in the Spectre's mind, the role that it plays is different from this particular role with James being possessed by the Red Lantern entity. James is possessed by an entity that's bent on rage. James is looking for vengeance. And so the, the Lantern entity takes possession of James and then James seeks vengeance. For the Spectre, the role he plays is a divine role, a particular role he plays in the universe. It's not a position he's thrust himself into. The Spectre was created by God for that purpose. So again, it's, it's, it's kind of one of these things of the natural order of things versus the unnatural order of things. And so what ends up happening, of course, is, is you know, the, the Spectre is basically attacked by James as a Red Lantern entity, which looks awesome. Uh, and then in turn, James basically kills Joshua, and then that's really the end of Joshua. But from there, Atrocitus steps in, and Atrocitus actually destroys this physical form, basically rips away the shell of sorts, and then basically frees, like, the Butcher from the body of James. And it's kind of cool, because the Butcher could easily just kind of restructure itself or kind of bring this body back or what have you. But the Butcher actually looks at Atrocitus and says, well, let's see what's what rages in your heart. I mean, I have no need to possess James anymore, because he's got gotten the vengeance that he seeks. He doesn't feel rage anymore. And if that rage is gone, then there's no reason for me to possess him. And so the result is that when it looks at Atrocitus, we get a, you know, a quick little three panel bit of his origin, which again, you're welcome to check out the full on origin of Atrocitus to really gain a, a huge understanding of what's going on. But you know, of course, you know, you have the Spectre step in, the Spectre basically disables the, disables the Butcher temporarily long enough for Atrocitus to seek control of it. Now, this is when things get pretty cool because when Atrocitus imprisons the Butcher inside of his own, uh, his own lantern battery, from there, the Spectre goes to destroy James because this is the role that the Spectre plays. James has basically sought vengeance and taken an innocent life. Now, the fact that he was possessed by the bull is irrelevant here. James would have killed Joshua had he been given the chance, regardless of whether he was possessed or not. And that's the distinct difference. That's the difference between the, the Spectre who would just kind of walk away and the Spectre who would take out James. Had the bull possessed James and then driven James to kill Joshua, that would have been a whole different set of events. It would have been a decision that James didn't want to make, but was forced to. But because James did this, the Spectre intends to destroy him. And this is where I say we get into this cool motivation about Atrocitus because Atrocitus steps in and says, this is fallacy. This is actually, you know, absolute nonsense. Sure, James wanted to kill this guy, but James had every reason to kill this guy. Now, this is where things get a little hairy and a little ambiguous because for the Spectre, there's, there's no real gray area there. There's no black and white. There's no ambiguity. You are a person who committed a terrible deed. And so you are a person who has to go. Done. That's it. With Atrocitus, it's, 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 it's kind of like this idea that Atrocitus sits down and says, well, I understand humanity better than you do, but it's not a human factor. It is a sentient, living, breathing, emotion, feeling organism kind of thing. The specter is just sort of an idea, a concept that bonds itself to any one particular being in order to serve its purpose. And even the specter is non corporeal doesn't have to actually be, you know, be bonded to someone. It can just kind of float out there, but the specter is usually always bonded to someone. And it's, it's always kind of cool to see that, that kind of thing happen. But Atrocitus basically says like, look, you've been bonded to living hosts, to human hosts since really, since like the earliest days of your existence. And 
and you still don't grasp them because the specter is not designed to. The specter is not designed to really understand humanity. I, mean, I guess to a degree it is in the sense that like that's why it's bonding to hosts, but it's never understood humanity. Atrocitus looks around and says, this is the nature of beings. People love, people hate, people fall into all these different emotional categories. James' desire to kill Joshua was not based on the fact that Joshua stole money. It wasn't based on the fact that Joshua like, you know, offended him or the woman he was with. It was because Joshua killed his daughter. What father wouldn't want to kill the man who killed his daughter? That's just the reasonable thing to do. That's, that's how anybody would normally respond. It makes sense. And so again, like, you know, the, the specter sort of says, okay, fine. Then like, you know, if that's how you want to be, then where do we go from here? And Atrocitus says, if you want to judge him, you have to judge me first. And so the specter does and the specter backs off. And it's cool because the specter simply says this war that you're involved in right now, like you believe that all you've wanted to do is capture the butcher and everybody that you've teamed up with, with Sinestro and Hal Jordan and Carol Ferris and so on. You simply see this as a means to an end to get the butcher and go about your business. But know that you're on a collision course, that Krona, the, the guardian that basically set in motion the creation of the, of the multiverse, the original guardian that was cast out, that he's very much alive and well, and you are involved in this war with him, whether you want to be or not. And so your war against Krona is effectively a holy war. It is a war you have to be a part of. But when this war ends, the time will come when I will arrive and I will judge you. And when I do, I will destroy you. Now, we'll actually have to kind of wait and, you know, look into the future to see whether or not that happens. But again, it is cool and it is intriguing because for Atrocitus, who, who gives us this monologue of saying he hates humanity, he hates humans, he's so much like a human. He's so much like a regular normal being. But again, this is the unique principle of Atrocitus because among all the Red Lanterns, with him being the one that created the core, he's the only one that's really able to maintain his autonomy. I mean, when someone's forced into the Red Lantern core, like they basically lose their minds. They're kind of mindless beasts for the most part. It's really kind of how they function. And it, and it serves its purpose because they're just sort of cutting a swath through the universe, attacking all these different things. And it's cool to just see them rage out like that. But it is it is interesting. And I, I really like it in terms of how this whole thing unfolds and, and what it does and so on and so forth. But anyway, guys, just a quick little one shot story. Uh, this will lead directly into the War of the Green Lanterns, the, the war with Krona. So we're basically moving into the next story arc uh, beyond Brightest Day. But with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comics Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoy this video, make sure you drop a like and I will catch you all later. Peace.